please join us as we sing Israel's national anthem, Hatikva. Good afternoon, and welcome to this very important briefing on Shattering the Silence with Dr. Kohav El Kayam Levy and Moran Adias. My name is Kathy Distelberger, and I am the National Chair of the Women's Division at Israel Bonds. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists infiltrated Israel and committed acts of unspeakable violence against women and children. Since then, the world has sat by and watched in silence. The Women's Division of Israel Bonds is here to shatter that silence. We want to ensure that the victims get justice and that the world will never forget what happened and will never allow this to happen again. We all must act as witnesses to these horrors and fight against their denial whenever we see it. This is a crucial mission of the Women's Division at Israel Bonds, and I urge you all to do the same. Me too should not mean me too unless you're a Jew. I'd now like to introduce Israel Bonds President and CEO, Donnie Neve. Since the outbreak of the war, Donnie has ensured that the Women's Division had whatever it needed to help groups around the country continue their critical work and continue to support women's women in Israel. Donnie, it's my privilege and honor to welcome you today, Donnie. Thank you, Kathy, for the intro and for your leadership, first of all. On October 7th, the world witnessed probably the most uh, vicious, savage crime against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. They beheaded babies, the children who were burned alive in front of their parents, the elderly who were tortured, and the women who were raped and murdered. Terrible crimes against women were committed, and the world has kept silence till the initiative taken by our guest speakers, Dr. Tuchab El Kayam and Moran Atias, who have put those terrible crimes against women on the international agenda, constantly revealing the, the hypocrisy of women rights organizations who kept silence. As days go by, on one hand, we see so many anti-Semitic groups, the ugly faces of the anti-Semitism. But on the other hand, so many more people understand that this is not just a war against Hamas, between Israel and Hamas. And it's even not just a war between us, the Jewish people, and Hamas. This is a war against the enemies of humanity and civilization. Dear friends, on this very special and different Hanukkah, while lighting the menorah, let's pray for our victory over our enemies, the safe return home of our soldiers, and the exit from darkness to the light of our hostages. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you, Donnie. 
And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kochav El Kayam Levy, is an expert on international law, human rights, and feminist theories. She is a law professor at Reichman University, the Davis Institute for International Relations at Hebrew University, and founder and head of the Devorah Institute for Gender and Sustainability Studies. Her research, which is published in top US legal journals, centers on women's international human rights, national security issues, and domestic implementation of international human rights law, religious liberties, transformative social changes, feminist theories, and sustainable development. Kokhoff served as a legal counsel for the Human Rights Division under the Deputy Attorney General of Israel. In that capacity, she consulted the government on the implementation of human rights standards and participated in international negotiations and international discussions. Kohav also served as an associate with the Supreme Court Department of the Israeli Attorney General's Office. After the murderous attack by Hamas, and when the evidence about gender-based war crimes unfolded, Levy established the Civil Commission on October 7th Crimes by Hamas Against Women and Children. Thank you so much, Dr. Levy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I have to share uh, that it's nighttime here in Israel. Um, I don't know, I just feel the need to share that it has been uh, extremely exhausting. Uh, I'm after um, a trip to the United States where I also visited uh, the bond. Uh, and so I'm grateful for this event. I'm grateful for organizing this. I think um, that I'm also grateful about the opportunity to share more about what we are doing and um, this historical mission uh, that we've been um, given. So, uh, can you hear me well? Just want to make sure. Yeah, okay. So, I'll do this as a conversation. Uh, I think it will be the easiest for me. Um, so, I'm a, I, I teach international law, human rights, feminist theories, climate justice, everything uh, that looks so uh, far now. Um, I had an institute on gender and sustainability. I was telling my friends just now when we lit the candles, the Hanukkah candles, that my work was about dreams, uh, dreams about the future, dreams about the future of women in Israel. Um, and now, um, I don't want to say nightmares, but yes, a little bit uh, working on these issues that um, are very difficult to handle. Um, so the 7th of October has uh, granted me the another title, which is the chair of the Civil Commission on Hamas's Crimes Against Women and Children. Um, I want to share with you uh, how it all started. So first of all, we were, um, I think, uh, as an international law expert, as early as the 7th of October, uh, we saw, we knew that we were seeing uh, crimes against humanity uh, in front of our eyes. Uh, we knew the hostage taking, the brutality of the killings, the massacre, the, the children, uh, families calling their, um, their relatives in Israel. And you all know that uh, we are uh, only one hour apart. So calling them, saying that they are being burned alive, uh, really the most terrible things that uh, I know that you were all aware of, but just for us, it translates into uh, the understanding that we're not uh, in only a national security event, that this is gonna be, uh, this, gonna, this is going to involve the international community. Uh, this is going to be tried in international tribunals, it's just the understanding that um, the magnitude of, of the events is just, it's something that we couldn't even uh, understand that or, or realize that is, is this really happening here in Israel? Is this, it, it was really unbelievable uh, as, as I, I imagine all of you uh, share uh, this feeling that it, it's not something that we could have under, uh, understand that's happening here. 
So I also want to say that Hamas documented everything. Uh, they came in with uh, cameras, GoPro cameras. They came ready to terrorize our people, to terrorize our society. Um, I'm writing something that I want to say about that. And um, and we were expecting the international community, our colleagues at the UN, to react to um, very initially just report what happened. Usually uh, during atrocities, we know that the international community very quickly responds uh, uh, condemning the crimes, uh, expressing solidarity with the country that has been affected by the crimes. And, and I want to go back just to the initial responsibility to um, to report what happened. There were atrocities uh, in a magnitude that is really uh, unbelievable, crimes uh, that so cruel that we would think the international community would just rise. And, and I want to be specific. I want to say that I'm talking about UN organizations. They have the mandate and responsibility to report to these crime, on these crimes and to, I want to say, um, notify the entire human rights community that something horrible has happened. And during the first few days, we were shocked, deeply surprised that they weren't doing their uh, very basic responsibility. Uh, some of uh, these UN officials or organizations um, have, have also released statements that uh, we couldn't believe that what we're seeing very, um, I want to say confused say statements. Um, confused is not the right word, but just really um, said twisted. Um, not not really not reporting what happened. And um, at the very first days, I remember uh, saying in the very first week saying that it, it is as if 7th of October has disappeared from time itself. Uh, they failed to report this. They failed to condemn the crimes. They failed to exp express solidarity. And I want to share that very naively. I thought that once I will um, um, report this and I will share what we know as civil society, as law professors, uh, we can change this. I'm just thinking of myself on the eighth day of the war, gathering this group of experts, thinking that we can do more, that we can uh, really affect uh, these organizations. And um, so we organized this um, this report, the report, uh, I drafted the report and um, and it was signed by more than 160 professors. Uh, just giving them credible information about what we've seen, expressing the violations of uh, uh, of human rights here and in international law. I want to say that usually human rights organizations do not get reports from 160 law professors. Some of them are former members of the UN uh, human rights committees, and um, they usually get reports from very uh, I want to say not so known civil society organizations. So I thought clearly when they see this report, they would react. We also made sure we are sending reports in the name of women's organizations in Israel and around the world. We sent a third report uh, in the name of women. It was like a civil petition. And gradually, once uh, I made sure these reports uh, were sent, um, I'll say it very simply, I sent these reports to every uh, relevant UN agency, formally and informally. All of us uh, made sure they got this, they, they're they going to see this and uh, probably going to react. And as the days went by, weeks went by, I want to say uh, this was uh, the silence became something else. So I want to I want to say a few things about the silence. I want to say um, when they kept silence, um, they're not only betraying us as Israeli women, they're betraying humanity, they're betraying universal standards, they're betraying everything we've worked for uh, in the past decades. They, worse than that, they fuel the fact that they kept silence has confused the entire system. It was a 
um, they created a fertile ground uh, for denial campaigns. They fueled hatred. They fueled uh, anti-Semitism around the world. It was very easy then uh, to deny what happened here. Uh, we were shocked to see that they're not only uh, keeping silent about what happened here in Israel, uh, some uh, UN rapporteurs um, even um, addressed the 7th of October as if it was uh, the, um, how would you say, as if it was an atrocity committed against the Palestinians. This was the worst that I've seen. Um, and I want to say uh, something else. These are, uh, we specifically addressed crimes against women and uh, the UN, UN institutes that uh, focus on the rights of women. And in this aspect, the, the silence is even worse because we know that crimes against women are go unrecognized. They go, uh, usually they are denied. And uh, I had a chance to address very early the UN uh, CEDAW committee. The, I want to say it's an experts committee, feminist scholars who are supposed to see how um, how these crimes are affecting women to to make sure women are protected and that they understand fully the entire mechanisms that um, denial mechanisms that are inflicted on women and. And I addressed them and I told them um, one day before my uh, my meeting with the statement, the CEDAW committee, a statement not even acknowledging the state of the hostages. Uh, so taking hostages to humanity, it's a continuous crime against humanity. They fail to recognize the, uh, the hostages. They fail, they fail to recognize 7th of October. And um, I told them that it is as if the same denial mechanisms that are inflicted on women in individual cases, right? Usually when women get rape, uh, get raped or um, they usually, they, they would not even um, report these crimes. And because the system is denying this, society is denying this um, and, and they know this. So I told them that the same denial mechanisms that are inflicted on individual women are now being inflicted on us as Israeli women as uh, mothers, as daughters uh, here in Israel. And I asked them, is there international law for Israeli women? Are we protected under those standards? Are we even considered human? Um, I think it was a, a, it was a huge, um, for me, something broke inside. I'm not sure I'm saying it properly, but it's just it's it has broken uh, uh, everything that I believe in. I'm not sure when I teach international law, I teach I teach international law with such enthusiasm, uh, with such a belief in the system that was created since the Holocaust, that was created um, from the destruction of society. We saw how human rights uh, emerged, and um, I truly believed in this system, even though I was never. Um, never naive about the political aspect and the bias against Israel, but uh, I, I never saw thought that uh, against such as atrocities we will see this silence. As I said, it's not only silence. This this silence is fueling hatred campaigns around the world and denial campaigns. Um, and I want to say that once I understood, I think a week afterwards, when I saw that they're not even responding. I was refreshing my email every day that they were not even responding. Um, and I started gathering all the information that we uh, that we had. Finally, I, I had this understanding very early that our mission is much greater than just uh, communicating with the international community that is not really communicating. Um, and I understood that our mission is different. I remember addressing the members of the commission and telling them um, that that our mission is to really collect every piece of information regarding what happened to women. We started getting information from many sources. I uh, We started collecting them and we understood that um, documenting what happened to women is gonna be crucial 
to the uh, to the investigation efforts to our historical, want to say, um, our history as a people. Because I seeing the denial, I think just um, emphasized the the fact that we have to act differently. We have. Re I remember saying that. Even if it's an information that some someone else wouldn't think is important, I want to collect it. And I think I shared with uh, the Jewish com uh, community in Riverdale that I have this vision uh, of a puzzle, of a burned puzzle, of a damaged puzzle, that we are collecting broken pieces of it. Some of it, we will never know uh, what happened. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, we will never find out. People are asking me, can you estimate how many women uh, were raped, how many, how many women were abused? And I think um, we will never know. I want to say that uh, many of the bodies were even uh, burnt in ways that we'll, uh, uh, we'll not know what happened to them. Um, some of the bodies that we saw are in such a conditions that um, we can only imagine what happened to them. Um, so that's the the understanding that uh, that we had very early that we have to document everything. That we really, I told journalists, uh, I remember journalists telling me, "How do you know this is true?" So I, I I I won't know. Maybe I will know only in five years when this little piece of information. Uh, I will get another witness that will shed light on what happened. Uh, and so uh, we establish an archive under the most uh, compelling international, we are establishing a, an archive under the most compelling international standards. Um, in this archive, we are cross-referencing information. We have protocols referring uh, whether this piece of information has been verified by several different sources or not. And perhaps uh, if I have time, do I have time? Um, Jill, yeah, can I continue? I'll continue, I'll just give myself permission. <laughs> I'm giving myself permission. Um, I wanna say that, um, just I wanna mention a, briefly a fraction of what we know. So um, I won't share the details. I won't share uh, the evidence uh, and the things that we have now collected, but I just want to share the process. So the evidence of the magnitude and the brutality of the sexual and gender-based violence perpetrated by Hamas uh, is really overwhelming and corroborated by multiple sources. Um, I want to say that the first evidence emerged as early as the morning of Saturday, October 7th, as I told you, during the attack themselves, as Hamas proudly posted live images and live streamed videos of the attack on social media. As you know, uh, some of the families uh, got um, horrible videos uh, of their relatives uh, on, on their social media, on their personal social media, seeing them being tortured and killed in the most inhumane ways. And I think this is a form of torture in itself. Um, next, what we saw, uh, this was the first evidence that we collected. Next came the reports from eyewitnesses, uh, multiple survivors from different locations, from the Nova festivals, from the Kibbutzim reported uh, that they witnessed women either in a condition, in, in the condition for, for example, naked bodies in a, in a terrible condition, or witnessed women being raped around them as they themselves themselves were hiding for their lives in the bushes, trying to avoid uh, detection by the terrorists. Next, uh, the week after, I think we started getting um, information from first responders, the ones that were that collected uh, the bodies, including reports of paramedic of a paramedic. I'm sure you've heard about this case, a paramedic that heard, entered a home in Barry to see 14 and 15 year old girls. Uh, naked and murdered in their bedroom, in their own bedroom. I won't get into the specific of what was uh, what they found there. Uh, just generally to say that uh, first responders were the uh, other, uh, the next um, to 
uh, to report of the atrocities against women and children. Um, I want to say about that, that we're also collecting information about sexual assaults against uh, that were committed against men. And I'm sorry to say that we also have evidence uh, of, of, of these cases. Um, next came forensic, the forensic workers and stories from, uh, from the morgue staff about the condition of women uh, bodies, including uh, broken bones, brutality, um, bro broken pelvic bones. I again, I won't get into the details and um, I'll say just um, the last uh, piece of information or pieces of information um, are from the testimonies of Hamas themselves in the investigation saying uh, openly admitting and uh, that their mission was to rape, humiliate Israeli women and girls. And um, they even explained receiving permission to uh, perpetrate these horrific acts from their religious leaders in order to instill fear in the Israeli public. So just as last two comments, I wanna say, um, I wanna, um, say two things. One, uh, visiting the United States, I think uh, one of my um, realiz um, great realization is that we're not 99 million Israelis grieving. We are millions of Jewish uh, people uh, grieving. I, I was shocked to see the sadness and the trauma uh, that, that I saw uh, in the Jewish communities. Everywhere I visited, I saw deep uh, sadness. Um, and so I want to say that everybody told us you're not alone. But I want to say back, you're not alone. We're with you. And um, and one last thing. Uh, in a week, uh, two weeks after we started collecting the evidence, we had a meeting with, uh, maybe it's, it's a story about hope. Uh, we had a meeting with Professor Catherine McKinnon. She's uh, one of the most prominent uh, international uh, f uh, scholars on crimes against women and war crimes against women and a feminist scholar. And she, we were very uh, anxious before meeting with her. Um, don't worry, I, I'll just taking one more minute. Uh, we were very anxious before meeting with her. We were ready with the data, with information. Um, I think on putting our arms uh, in the, the other war we were battling um, after 7th of October of this recognition. And when she came on the Zoom to speak with us, uh, what she said was, um, um, she told us, uh, I know you've been through hell. Uh, I know, uh, I can't imagine what you've been through. How can I be of help? Um, are you okay? And I want to say after weeks that we were, uh, after these days that we were uh, really doing every effort to to prove everything and uh, respond to, to this, um, to what happened, I think uh, once she said it, we all started, we really all started crying. Um, I think we're not children, we are experts on this field, but the fact that she was able to acknowledge what happened and to, to, to ask us, are you okay? And we all started, um, I think it was a very difficult moment when we understood that no one is asking us or allowing, allowing us to heal, uh, to, to, to think about what we are going through. And we were able then to, to share with her the existential fear and what we are experiencing as Israeli women. And I think this is demonstrating belief. And I'm I'm hoping, I'm hopeful um, that we'll see more of that. And I can share with you that of what I feel, maybe the UN needs to go through a radical transformation, but I, I am meeting allies in the United States and across Europe uh, that make sure that we know that we're not alone and they're going to help us and assist us and uh, work with us to reveal every, all the atrocities that happened on October 7th. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kocha Kayam Levy. You're doing such incredible work. I don't know how you keep it together because it's so hard for us to keep it together 6,000 miles away. 
Um, I know it's so difficult, but it's work that must be done. So thank you so much for your efforts and please keep going with it. My name is Shira Lewis and I am a member of the National Board of Directors at Israel Bonds, as well as a former National Women's Division Chairperson. It is my absolute privilege to introduce our next speaker, Moran Atias. Moran Atias is an Israeli actress and an international success. She first appeared on Italian TV and cinema, eventually landing her roles on the hit shows Tyrant on FX, Crash on Stars, 24 Legacy on Fox, The Village on NBC, and most recently, Animal Kingdom on TNT. Moran's most memorable role in cinema was third person, opposite Oscar winner Adrian Brody and Liam Neeson, where she received rave reviews and a star on the Belgian Walk of Fame. Moran has a long record with humanitarian work in hospitals and fighting for women's empowerment, as she is the founder of Me First, a nonprofit putting women first, building awareness, and hosting events, creating opportunities for women. In 2010, Moran helped rescue dozens of injured women and helped to provide life-saving surgeries in Haiti. She also helped build the first school, high school in Haiti, granting young girls free education for 12 years. A classroom in the school is named after her. In 2022, Moran volunteered during the COVID outbreak in the ER in Ichilov Hospital. Today, she is advocating for women's rights and particularly for women that were raped and sexually abused by Hamas on October 7th. Moran has sent a direct message to leading women's organizations like Me Too and the UN Women's Committee, criticizing their silence and demanding an investigation that must protect all women. Since October 7th, Moran has been volunteering in the official forum for the families of the kidnapped and missing, hosting events, filming home videos, and bringing world attention through millions of views on her social media platforms. Please watch a short video from Moran. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists had specific instructions that were found in their pockets to violate women. Women were raped, women were murdered, women were burned alive. Their lifeless bodies paraded on streets in Gaza as civilians chant, spitting at them with pride. 240 innocents were kidnapped. Over 100 women, little girls, baby girls. Hamas filmed it, and the world saw. And women organizations stayed silent. Why? Why did they stay silent? Maybe they didn't hear about it. Maybe they don't have internet. Maybe they were waiting for the right time. Well, in fact, on October 20th, the most leading women organization did speak up. God, I was excited. UN Women Organization released a very concerned report for the displaced women from Gaza, but nothing for the displaced women from Be'eri. Nil Oz, Kfar Aza, Ashkelon, Sderot, that were attacked by Hamas. Nothing for the Israeli mothers that buried their daughters and sons. Nothing for the Israeli girls raped and left to be spit on. Nothing for 44 days. Maybe Jewish women don't matter enough. Because if you can't condemn a sadistic, barbaric, rapist, woman-hating terrorist organization, then who are you? I want to believe when you say humanity, not racism. I want to believe that me too means we too. We too ask you to say something. We too, Israeli women, ask you to do something. I'm shaking. I shouldn't be here. These words shouldn't be coming out of my mouth. I shouldn't be telling you to keep your promise. But I'm here because I want my daughter to grow in a world that I'm proud to be part of, a world that protects all women. It's time to speak up before they come to your homes, to your mothers, to your child. And I warn you, they don't knock.
Welcome, Moran, and thank you for joining us. Can you please speak a little about your decision to stay in Israel after the October 7th attacks? Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me, and thank you. Um, it was I really wanted to hear uh, Dr. Kachav, and uh, I was actually reaching out to her because her work is so important for all of us, and I know it's difficult, and it takes our souls but it's really to protect the next generation that is going to grow here or anywhere in the, in the world. So I really thank you. Um, it's more than a mitzvah. It's, you know, it's, it's our duty. It's really our duty and uh, our legacy. And uh, regarding about my decision to stay, I really, I tried to leave. Um, I have to say that I tormented Elal many times, booking my flight to leave, and I just couldn't. I just couldn't leave the posters that I see of the hostages, leave the family, leave the streets, leave the pain. I don't want to leave the pain. I don't want to leave. Um, we're grieving. We're grieving. We're sitting a shiva, a long, a long shiva on so many people. And of course, um, something is broken, obviously, in this belief of uh, the world and you know humanity and this terminology that, uh, you know, like for me, your words are bullshit. Your words are bullshit and we're going to call on it. Um, so there's obviously the pain and, and the, the loss, but also I have this, I wouldn't say anger, but I just have this necessity and commitment to speak even louder and clearer. There is no, you know, you can't, you can do, as you said, Kohav, you know, this confusing releases. Sorry, uh, I'm not sorry. I'm going to call it out. I'm going to name what it is if you can't, because it has a name. It's called terrorism. It's called rape. It's called violating bodies. It's called mutilating intimate body parts. It's called sadism, barbarism. It's called monstrous, okay? It's not resistance. It's not freedom fighters. We have to change this vocabulary because that vocabulary is is causing more deaths it's causing this justification these protests these slogans that are infiltrating universities and educating young people educated people to think this is well you know um has an excuse and i give it to you know sometimes i take it to a very simple scenario where a lot of countries understand it it's like it's like blaming the beating husband. It's like you, you're domestic violence and the the, the husband and the, these cases happen all over. And I've just been in Italy and there's a, a there's a incline of um, one of three women is murdered by her husband or boyfriend because she decided she wanted to be free. OK, so it's like blaming the, the woman for wanting to be free. So no, 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 this is, you know, the guy that is abusive, the guy that is raping, the guy that is, he, he's the sick person. It's not my responsibility to make sure that he feels, you know, maybe he's not provoked by my existence. So that terminology is so important. We've worked a lot on ourselves. You know, that's why when I started working on me first, it was right after me too. And I was like, we have to, women have to work on ourselves to know that we're entitled that we don't have to ask for permission for everything. We're just entitled to have free, freedom of choice on our bodies, on our on our voice, and our on our choices how to live our life, how to dress, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And now, you know, once we we have this confidence, we must take an accountability these crimes, um, yeah, and bring them to justice. And I, I find. Um, some of my friends that are have been advocating for these um, similar similar um, crimes against women and from Iran, and they really understand it. They get it because they know what terrorism is. And with all due respect, um, people that are in their comfort, I lived in different countries for many years, and I know they can't understand it because they can't understand me taking a bus to school and my mom being worried that it will blow up. They, they don't, you know, or, you know, if we go to a wedding, maybe it's going to blow up because that's what happened. Or you go to a club and maybe there's going to be a, another attack or you're just sitting having coffee and doesn't go and somebody's going to spray it. You, they don't get it because the media doesn't also report about that as much as they report about the rest. So we, we do have a lot of work to do, 
But um, that's what we need to do. We just have to do the work through the media. We have to expose their politics. I mean, it's it's evident to us, and we're gonna, you know, we're all working. I just feel like this this great strength that the Jewish people is 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 showing, and um, the Jewish community around the world that I think is really in shock. Um, they're just stunned. I have a lot of. I mean, I live in the states now. I'm currently in Israel, and I've spoken to a lot of my friends that are in very important positions. I think they're they're just was they were in a state of shock for a long time. Well, we got to get out of the shock, and we're still grieving, obviously, but we we have to fight um, to defend our values. Really, it's what it is, our values and the shared values of other democracies. And call, you know, Hamas is connected to Iran, and Iran is financing that in Hezbollah. This is not just our little war. This is everybody's interest, and that's why I wanted to end it, that video, we like, you know, basically watch out because they're not going to let you know when they're coming for you. And um, yeah, I just think that finding that common language with other people, what they care about, speak their language. They say, I don't know if they say it in English, but in Rome, be Roman. Um, so in Rome, I speak the language they understand. I did find a great support from the um, political um position across the board across the board i'm just going to share you something that was fun for me to see we, i was supposed to speak in a, in a public there was um a manifestation and so many politicians showed up and spoke about against terrorism and against uh anti-semitism that i was like okay i don't need to say it anymore i'm just going to talk about something that else but they were very i think the political uh, arena really understands what we're dealing with because they also was they were exposed to the videos and i think that makes a very big difference when you show oprah says it oprah lost my points i mean she's she's done for me but um she says a great line she's like when people show you who they are believe them and they showed us they showed us who they are so it's not just me to testify and say this is what i saw this is what i'm experiencing this is what they're saying believe them okay that was um, a long answer i don't even remember yeah, the question. Yeah, no, that's yeah. great <laughs> but um speaking of all the work that you've had to do why did you decide to work with the families and victims of the kibbutz attacks and how how are you working to help them so i had a feeling because i lived for for many years outside of israel and i was fueled by the media the international media because i wasn't connected to the israeli media so i always realized i saw that we're just getting a piece of the story, a piece of the narrative, like just, you know, like three minutes and it's usually covering one side and it formed also my opinion on Israel. And then I, when I was here in, in previous attacks, I was like, whoa, whoa, this is not what you see out there. This is different. They're just not reporting all the beats of the story. They're skipping beats. They're skipping very important action like ceasefire they broke ceasefire but then they don't report that so all of a sudden israel is the aggressor and so i felt it was so vital for me to stay here on the ground and document with my own eyes and with my with my own storytelling they can't tell me i'm lying especially those who have been following me for years and appreciate me as an international artist um so i stayed i went to the south the first day i really i love hospitals not as a patient but I love hospitals and I love volunteering there because I really believe in two institutions, um, you know, the medical world, hospitals and, and education. Those are really the two places we all go to and, you know, save our lives. Obviously the law too, but, you know, it can always be improved. But those are the two places that I feel that I, that I would want to be more uh, effective. So I went to Soroka, which is in, in Be'er Sheva, it's in the south, south part of Israel. I imagine that most of the patients are going to arrive there because it happened in the south. Um, to, to be honest, they didn't want me to volunteer there. So I tried again the next day because I'm chutzpanit, as we say. And uh, they said no. And I was like, okay, well, all right, you're missing. But they just wanted me to visit the patients. And I felt... I don't feel like I want to be a cheerleader. I need to do more of 
I felt like documenting it to the world would have been something that I can contribute. So I reached out to the first family that I found in Be'er Sheva, and it was the family of Noah Gamani, beautiful girl. Now she's 26 years old. She, she celebrated her birthday, celebrated in Hamas. She had, hasn't been released yet. She's, she's a hostage. She's still a hostage. And I met her parents, um, beautiful family, mixed family. Mother is Chinese, father is Israeli. They just have this poetry to them. They weren't even angry. They didn't ask for blood. They didn't ask for revenge. And it was like, this is my people. This is the message I want to show to the world. They're asking for peace in the Middle East, though their daughter, their only daughter, is held hostage. And we saw the video online. It went, it went viral, seeing her terror, speaking of terrorism. So I, I, I thought like it would be beautiful, I mean, beautiful, to show it in their home, in their private, because this happened into our homes, okay? Everybody has a home. That's a language, Italians and Americans. And you know, everybody can understand. So I wanted to have that personal take and I made it in a, in a language that in social media lives for one minute and a half right. with the music and, and telling the story of, of the person. These people have faces, they have homes, they have parents, they have dreams. She went to a music party, to, to a festival, to dance. To say about this specific video was uh, brought down. I don't know why Facebook took it down because it was actually very successful. And I didn't speak about any of the misery, any of the pain, it wasn't even like violent. Then I did another story with her. Uh, the mother is um, dealing with um, stage five cancer. And I went to visit her in the hospital and I asked her if you're, you're willing to show this part of the story and she wanted to. So we did another video and that video was brought down. So it shows that A, we're bothering people with this content. We're bothering people with the truth. Therefore, we're going to keep telling it. Nobody, you know, we're just going to be there outside of the uh, outside of um, the UN offices on the on on rallies in the Senate. I spoke at the Senate. I actually did choose to be specific about the descriptions right. because for me, from my experience with storytelling, the more specific you are, the more it arrives. So I told the story of, of, of I really acted out a scene of a girl that goes on to a party and asks her mom permission to go to to dance it's a it's a peace peace festival and i go moment by moment what happens to her and yeah that's the truth we're not you know this is yeah um you know i've i by no means am i as influential as you are but i've had things from my instagram story taken down as well and i don't understand why it they seem pretty mild but um you know obviously you're touching a nerve there so that brings me to my next question. Um, what has been the biggest challenge you have faced with bringing the crimes against women and children to the international community? And do you feel that you have overcome that challenge? You know, I don't see challenges outwards. I mean, I, that's just my personality. Usually the challenge is in with, within me, you know, sometimes. So I did uh, one time that we taped it. I mean, I did it in one take and then I, uh, I realized what I was saying. I realized the words that are coming out of my, my, my mouth. And that's when I added, I'm shaking. That I just, I, I'm, these words shouldn't come out of my mouth because that was just, I shouldn't be speaking, you know, right now saying these words. This is, so that's a challenge. But, you know, obviously I overcome it. Out there, honestly, I'm not ready to fight. I'm not in, I'm, I, I don't like wars. I don't even like, I don't like guns. I mean, I'm not that, that type of person. I don't like, let's go hit them. It's not, it's not that, um, I'm not, that's not my, my personality. Um, so it's really about just taking, taking, collecting ourselves, collecting ourselves and making sure why I'm saying this, why I'm saying this and who am I talking to? And the next video I've written and kind of waiting for the right moment um, is directly to Seema Bauhaus. She's the head of the UN Women. So it's targeted. It's specific. She's a Middle Eastern woman. She's Jordanian like me. She has one daughter like me. And initially I was like, I should say thank you that she said something. And I was like, excuse my French, fuck the thank you. I'm not thanking her. 
you know, I'm just going to address her, you know, I'm just articulating that. Uh, the other challenges is to compose, <laughs> of course, <laughs> but I, I, I've actually succeeded doing that also in Italy. Um, and then occasionally, you know, like Khab is saying, um, I find myself allowing myself to fall apart, saying that this is very difficult. I cry. Sometimes I cry, share my cry because I know other, this is something that I learned from being a woman, you know, like holding on to the shame and holding on to the guilt and holding on to, to doing it alone. I have to let go of it. I have to share it with my community. And I find other women and men saying like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the same way. And then we lift each other up and we go back to, to do the work. So it's allowing myself this moment of God, I can't believe we just said this, or, or I felt feeling super lonely in Rome. I didn't want, you know, I came to Rome on a mission on a with a delegation to speak for Israel and do all these important things. And I was walking in the streets and I was like, I don't want to be here. It's just these moments of solitude and, and these things. And, but then I remind myself why we're doing this, why all of us here are connected today. We need this. We need each other. Uh, we need this presence. We need to hear advice. We need to hear that it's difficult. And we need to hear that we're doing something in the right direction. We are. Seema Bauhaus did respond. She didn't say the right words. We're going to, I'm positive, there's going to be an investigation. I'm positive also, I have a strong feeling that women are going to come and talk. I have a strong feeling that they'll understand that their horrible story needs to be told. Um, so I'm, and it will be told loudly. I'm seeing also Steven Spielberg is going to do a documentary with the testimonies. Yeah, we could say like he could have done that earlier. I don't care. He's doing it now. 60 days, it's not later because when he's going to do something, it's going to be watched because he's Steven Spielberg and it's very important that he's taking on this initiative and he's gonna and even Oprah I I, I have faith that she's gonna she's gonna hear these stories and it's okay if they have sympathy for the Palestinian people I share that sympathy um, but I also say in my next video that Hamas is not an organization from Mars okay it's not a different planet it's from it's Palestinian terrorist organization so we need to add that when we're describing it because they're they're kind of separating it like there's the Palestinian people that are in misery and they're all victims and then there's Hamas. Well, it's not so black and white because if it was black and white, it would have been easier to deal with this, but it's not. It's embedded in a big population. So now in this next video, it's going to be, you know, it's a pal. She didn't say. OK, when she finally spoke up, she didn't say Israeli women were raped by a Palestinian terrorist organization. She said in a, in a gen very, very. No, it has to be specific. So, um, yeah. Right. Words matter and action, you know, obviously. Yes. Like um, and obviously social media is a very important part of all of our lives. Um, how, do, how do you think the role of social media has helped in raising awareness internationally of the October 7th crimes? And do you feel it's hindered awareness in any sort of way? What do you mean by hindered awareness? I, I want to make sure. um, you know, do you think that social media has been helpful or has it been harmful? I'm using my social media to communicate my my th this video that you know you showed was shared by forty thousand people sharing. That's that's insane, you know. And and I'm not like a social media. Um, I'm not I'm not an influencer. I'm, I'm an actor and and creator. Okay. So it was it, it means that people were interested in that content and they they wanted to share that. Um, I think it's our tool to um for whoever has a telephone and to use that um i'm also getting messages from people that they can reach out to me you know i can write to i i text some people that i want to say hey thank you or not thank you or whatever or sharing images with with certain people and i also had some sometimes i dedicate before i go to sleep i have a, a banter with somebody that 
calls me first a murderer. And at the end of the conversation, they do apologize and they understand how complex it is because they start with these slogans. And I do find the patience there with them. And I go into video messages, uh, um, messages with sound so they can hear me. They know who I am. Sometimes I don't know who they are. And we start, start to have a conversation the other day with Francesca. She seemed like she's she's a great, I mean, not great. I don't know what, but she was started with me killing babies and murdering and all that stuff into a conversation where she doesn't really have a solution to offer. Okay. And she understand that it is Iran and it is. So it was slowly, slowly. I gave her half an hour of my time. And then I said, now with, with you know, I have a daughter and I want to spend the Shabbat because it was in, in Saturday with her. And she's like, I'm sorry. I said, why are you cursing me? You don't know me. Why do you hate somebody you don't know? Why do you hate, how can you hate somebody you don't know? I don't hate you. So it imme immediately diffuses her anger, her rage about what's happening in Palestine and in Gaza. And I said, okay, I understand, but what do you want us to do? How do you want us to, what do you want us to do for our hostages? She didn't have answers. So then it became a conversation. So I do it, you know, I do it with, with, with guys too. They, 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 some of them tell me I'm, a bad actor. I'm like, I'm an amazing actor. He's like, you're stupid. I'm a genius. And <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, he's like, okay, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. It's like, like just last, one last video I'm going to send to you. Boom. I send him something that is atrocious. He's like, blah. And he can't, this is something they filmed. So I said, who are you defending? Who are you protecting? I said, what? And then I give him another a a question to them. Criticizing is so easy, but I said, okay, let's say your slogan realizes from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. You succeeded. What then? What country will it be? What Middle East would it be? What world would it be? They don't want that world. They don't want Hamastan. So what are you fighting for? And uh, sometimes asking them the question is more powerful than responding. Right. That's actually a great segue into my next question for you. What advice would you give people in the United States and also abroad about how to combat the denial or misinformation about the October 7th attacks? I believe you've already answered that, but um, if you could elaborate even further, that would be fantastic. Um, I think each and every one of us has a language and an audience and they they can use that specific language whether they speak through food or hobbies or education or law and they find that language but always i believe that personal stories really really help there's of course the video of 47 minutes of horror but a lot of people took out from that movie a, a, a story of a father and two boys that's what really resonate with them. So it's that telling of that specific one specific story that can stay with them, that image of something that can happen to them. So if I meet a father with with a father, I tell that father story with the two boys that, you know, whatever they witness. If I see a mother, I tell them about my fear for my own daughter, and maybe they have a daughter, that she was raped eight times, eight times cut her so and i go into the specifics i say exactly what happened because it has to sound grotesque because it was grotesque right. because i'm not making it prettier for them i'm not and uh, i say it nicely i don't say it like look at what they did no i said this is what we're living from the compassion and with the tone that i feel like in america you do need a tone that is um less israeli um which has a different rhythm and they hear it better and in italian so it's kind of goes case by case and really um stay stay proud we are really an incredible people seriously um and to be honest between us you know we're friends they're also jealous the one 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 lady that i you know went on and on and on and she's from London and she's Muslim. At the end of the conversation, um, she, first of all, she told me that from the river to the sea is an exaggeration. So I was like, oh, okay, so why do you yell? She's like, no, you know, we exaggerate. I'm like, okay. But then she ended the conversation saying that she appreciates 
and admire the Jewish religion religion that like her, that she's a Muslim, that she they pray multiple times a day and they're faithful. And she said, like, not like Christians. She even found com common. She, she was admiring. She said, you know, I met this uh, this couple and uh, I think it was uh, she didn't know what day it was that they didn't want to take the bus. They had to walk for like uh, two kilometers because it was she's like that faith is something so beautiful. So I'm like, these people really look up to us. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm even more, more proud to be Israeli and Jewish um, in these times that we're showing at least what I'm seeing here in the country, everybody's volunteering, but not like, you know, sending money with their hands, with their hearts, of course, with their pockets, but with their hearts, like being present, coming to the square. That's what really the family of the hostages really care about. Supporting, picking up cherries or tomatoes for the farmers, like beautiful, beautiful unity, beautiful strength. And um, I always think that in war, nobody wins because everybody loses. But we will restore our values and our safety again. That's what I believe in. Great. Um, yeah, the the unity that we've had in Israel and, and for Jews all over the world has been the only, one of the only silver linings about all of this. It's really, you know, when ships are down, we know, you know, we know who our family is and who, you know, the strength of unity. Um, so that brings me to my last question. We've all seen horrific videos about what's been going on in college campuses here in the United States and, and abroad. And do you have any advice for young women on college campuses today? Because from what I've seen, the videos, these women are terrified. Yeah, I have um, two cousins that went to, they finished in universities and they're very, uh, they, they told me they feel isolated in their grief. And I just, I know that it seems, and it, it is, but it's always like half the country, even in, in elections, right? Half the country was liberal and half the country was conservative or a Democrat and Republic. So not everybody hates us, relax. It just looks that way. I mean, I, I I really think that half in elections too. So half hates Trump and the other loves him, or some some somewhere in it's, the world is divided. The world is divided, and you know what? I don't care that you don't like me. You can you 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 don't like me from maybe ignorance. You don't know the facts. You don't know, or you're jealous, or whatever. You 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 don't know that I'm I'm not white not the white Jew classic. So you don't even know. So I don't, I don't, I don't think we should give those people so much importance. They really don't need to own our integrity and our dignity. Um, it's, I'm not responsible for their stupidity. It's like, I'm not responsible for a, a, a violent husband. I am responsible if I stay. Okay. So not staying, taking action, suing those university is an action. They go low. Oh, Michelle said that. Another member, she's going to come back. Don't worry. I believe in that too. They go low, you go high. They go down with these slogans, you go high. Go by the law. Bring them to court. Sue them. There is the Jew hater, um, Jew database uh, account. Brilliant. Shame them. Don't, don't, you don't have to participate in their mud you know we don't have to play in that mud and that's the only and and take take that and take a different route and go to the where the, where the light is where people are willing to have a conversation but who who, are, who doesn't they're not worth your time they really aren't wow thank you so much moran the work you're doing is incredible and you're so inspiring to all of us. I think I can safely say that for everyone here on this Zoom call. Um, we just really appreciate your time and, and your words and, and keep fighting the good fight. Um, I'd now like to call on our national- I just wanna community. say also a last thank you to, <laughs> um, just because I like to end with gratitude and, and thank all of you that joined and thank Israel Bond that initiated this important conversation 
uh, Zev and uh, Danny and all the, the team and the men included. This is not just a woman fight. This is, you know, fathers and brothers to protect our sisters and daughters and each other. So I thank you for having me and for this initiative. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to call on our National Women's Division Director, Danielle Ross, for some concluding remarks. Danielle? Thank you, Shira, and thank you so much, Dr. Levy and Moran. Your work is so inspiring, and unfortunately, it's very much needed. I also want to thank our moderator, Shira Lewis, and our National Women's Division Chair, Kathy Distelberger, as well as our President and CEO, Donnie Neve, and Stuart Gowritz, the Vice President of Sales, for their support of this event. My name is Danielle Ross, and I am the National Women's Division Director of Israel Bonds. Shortly following the outbreak of war on October 7th, Donnie, Stuart, Kathy, and I watched the world remain silent as Israeli women and children suffered horrific attacks of violence, rape, and torture, and we knew we could not stand by. We owe a duty to the victims to speak out and share their stories and seek out justice. As Dr. Levy and Moran pointed out, the best thing we can do for the victims is to speak up and make sure these atrocities never happen again. We used to say never again when referencing the Holocaust. We must say it once more. Never again is now. There is never a reason for rape or sexual assault. The international community needs to stand with Israel now.